In this session, Brother Ron Gilbert will be our speaker. The topic is we need to learn from Jesus how to reach out to lost people. Brother Gilbert and I have been friends for a long, long time. Appreciate his work in the kingdom. He's now working with the South Pittsburgh congregation. Did you say 16 years, Ron? 16 years there, and we appreciate him being here today. He's a former Greens Lake Road member way back. That's probably last century. <laughs> Probably last century, but we're excited to have this lesson. It's so exciting to talk about evangelism and build each other up as we talk about this great topic. Brother Ron, come and speak to us. Good morning. It is good to see such a beautiful group of people. Good to see you, Rick, Freddie. But... Uh, Used to have a first sergeant do that. He'd walk in, good morning, men. Everybody'd say good morning. He'd say Gilbert. So uh, here I am trying to appeal to people to be more spiritual. And Roger gets up here and wants to talk about f uh, physical food. I feel like Jesus and John there, you know? <laughs> the misunderstood man, right? Well, I am glad to, I'm not as glad now as I was a minute ago, but I'm pretty happy to be here. It's always good to come to Greens Lake Road, and uh, Brother Ke Keith just absolutely did not do anything that I asked him to do. I called, left him a message, said, really appreciate it if you'd really bomb. And that way the level will be real low, and I can step in and, you know, maybe, well, no, he did a great job. He always does, and very, very glad to uh, be a part of this lectureship and be a part of or, uh, Youth Day and be a, a part of the, everybody's here. Man, I'll just look around, and I see... Uh, so many people that I've known for such a, a long time, and uh, I could see more if I had brought my glasses up here, but I've got these uh, first few rows. I didn't mean to make these young ladies up here uncomfortable a minute ago. We were singing, and I just heard these angelic voices, and I just knew it wasn't Roger who was sitting to my side, so I knew it had to be somebody behind him, and uh, y'all sing really wonderfully, and I'm glad to have been sitting in front of you. Uh, keep that up. Got a... Uh, uh, a lot more than I could say, but we had a good brother, a president of a, a Christian college, came with us and visited not too long ago. And, I mean, he gave his whole spiel about the college and everything. And so, I mean, 15 minutes of his time is gone. And he said, you know, I had a good sister come to me one time and saying, you know, you could get a lot more done if you'd skip all the commercials. And so uh, we'll do that, and we'll dive right into our text, because I think we have some uh, pretty uh, great things to talk about, especially if we think about Jesus following his example. How did Jesus reach people? And um, talking about evangelism, it is one of those areas where I think it's kind of like going and talking to uh, uh, the Atlanta Falcons about winning Super Bowls. You know, it's uh, sometimes we're, we're not as evangelistic as we could be. In fact, I think we're poor at it. Um, and I, I don't mean to be discouraging in any way, but there's always room for improvement, right? When uh, I was a member of the largest denomination uh, in the Southeast at the time, the largest independent church, uh, they uh, called themselves a church, but it was uh, evangelistic oriented. They had a lot of members. Now, don't get me wrong. There'd be between 10 and 12,000 people on a Sunday morning. And they had 150 missionaries self-supported from that single group of people. They had 150 people, 150 different mission works throughout the world. Never forget, they had a big banner that hung behind the pulpit for years, and it said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Boy, I knew that verse inside and out, and I could see Jesus on the cross, standing above the world. And that, that made an impact to me. I even went out and knocked doors. We had joy buses that would go throughout all of Chattanooga. And, uh, you know, of course, they had a ready-made workforce, and that they had the Tennessee Temple University right there. A great place to pull people off of. And so evangelism, evangelists go knock doors and they have all these things going on. And uh, it was, uh, you know, my time in the church, the church of God, the body of Christ. We don't seem to get as excited about evangelism as we ought. Uh, when we look back, we want to be disciples of Christ. We want to do what Jesus did. Well, look what he did. Uh, and that's what we're going to try to do. You know, he is our example. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21, the, 
the idea there, of course, is suffering. That's the context. But he's our hupagramas. You know, he's the, the ride under. We look at his life and we try to pattern ourselves by looking at that perfect A, like when you were in kindergarten and you had to trace those lines, that perfect A, and look at what he did. And it just as closely as we can be the kind of person, be the kind of evangelist, be the kind of teacher and preacher that he was. You might say, man, that was Jesus, you know? He was perfect. I, I've got, I'm nowhere near, I can never do, of course you can. But you can try, and you can try to be what he would have you to be. Brother Keith quoted Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 just a moment ago and following. Let this mind or this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What did he do? He did some things he wasn't too excited about, if, I, if you ask me. He did it willingly. But even when it, right before he was to be crucified, what was, he, what was his prayer? Father, if it be thy will, you know, can, can this cup pass? This is really not something I really... And who would want to go through that? Who wants to go talk to people about Jesus? Well, sometimes it's, we're kind of uncomfortable about it. I remember when I first came out of denominational error, I seriously did not want to open my mouth because everything that I had learned, I, would, I just had it wrong. And so I was scared to death. I was going to say the wrong thing. I didn't think that I knew enough. And henceforth, I didn't say anything because all my background, everything had been based on stuff that just simply wasn't true. And I'm afraid that sometimes we do that. We're afraid because we don't think that we have every single answer every time that we can't be like Jesus and be, have a, the Holy, you know, the Holy Spirit, and a, you know, unproportionately. And answer every question that we can't talk to anybody about anything. And that is not how we handle any other aspect of our lives. You know, I guarantee you, you can tell me your favorite band. I guarantee you got a favorite song. I guarantee you, it is amazing to me how you young people can know actors and producers and things like that of different various films. You're, you're hip on everything. You know everything. It's just amazing this huge sponge you have in the top of your, you know, top, above your neck. And he can just take in all this information. But when it comes to things like talking to somebody about Jesus or what to do to be saved, we act like, well, I'm, man, you know, I'm just not there. You know, why aren't you there? You know, if he's excited about it, is he excited, as excited about it as you were, say, I was going to say Star Trek. Does that even come on anymore? You know, <laughs> uh, Mandalorian. There we go. Right. Uh, you know, it's. If you're that excited about it, you'll learn more and you'll want to. And like he said, well, go, you don't have to know it all. You don't have to know a great deal of it. Just know enough to care about somebody and say, look, man, you need to, you need to know who Christ is. And I, I don't have all the answers. I'm kind of afraid to even talk to you about it, to be honest. But I know some folks, maybe you could come with me. You know, maybe you could come to Sunday school with me. Or maybe you could come and uh, meet my mom or dad if they're members of the church or somebody that you're comfortable with that you could uh, help get them with. So we're going to look at... One of the things that uh, I think at your age, all, uh, you know, mo most of you, uh, is a little easier now than it will be. And maybe that's an excuse that I'm making for myself. And that is compassion. You know, when you get a little older, it has been my experience. Now, I, just, I can just tell you about me. But it's really hard to love some people. In fact, it's really hard to have some compassion with some folks sometimes because... The, the things that are going on in my mind is not compassion. It's not Christ-like. And so I'm just trying to shut it down and shut it out because I get upset with people. Uh, and the older I get, the less tolerance and the less patience that I have with people. I wasn't like that when I was younger. In fact, it took a, a lot to, to bother me. But now it seems like things that uh, I was well-versed in or brought up in, you know, such as, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, you know, what a great day, you know, God, flag, country, duty, honor, you know, all those things that I just thought, well, that's the way you roll. And now I'm told, that ain't the way you roll. <laughs> You're rolling backwards, man. Where you been? No such thing as duty or anymore or honor. Well, that's just whose opinion you're talking about. Country? <laughs> Look how messed up this country is, man. We were based on chasing Indians around with uh, six guns and stuff. This country's... Out. And so, so for somebody like me, it was all about, I wanted to go in the Army just because, you know, that's what young American... Boys did back in the day, you know, we, we went to the army. I mean, we were all about defending the, the, the country from those, you know, uh, can't say Ukrainians, but from the Russians, you know, I mean, that, that was the big deal back then, you know, so we were all about duty and honor. And, and so as you see those things change, you're not there yet. You haven't kind of been set uh, like some of us older people have. And so you're, 
you're, you're learning things, you're seeing things, you're trying to put it all together. And, uh, and a lot of times your heart's a lot bigger. You know, when Jesus uh, was trying to tell his disciples, you know, uh, this is what you need to be like. He brought a child into his midst. They're more forgiving. They're more lo loving. You ever see a kid out on, kids out on a playground? Or I don't know if you ever pay attention, but, uh, you know, if one of them falls down and gets hurt, you know, and starts crying and stuff, generally there'll be a lot more, uh, you know, uh, kids that come around, especially at a younger, younger age. Uh, they're, they're concerned. You know, they have a great compassion. We think about Jesus. One of the things that st sticks out about me with Jesus is that, you know, he stayed where he was long enough for Lazarus to pass, you know. Uh, he stayed there so that that would happen so that he could go back, raise him from the dead so that not only could his disciples see it, the other folks could see it, but that was for a purpose. And yet he's standing there at the grave knowing full well what's fixing to happen. And he's fixing to bring a man back from the dead and yet everybody's mourning and crying. And what does he do? He weeps with those that weep. He had compassion. He cried. So what does it mean to be, to be compassionate? I think your heart now is as tender as it's ever going to be. I think about my personal remembrances from school when I was younger. Yes, we had school back then. There was a young man that I was really good friends with. He lived about three blocks down from me. His name was Robert Metcalf. He was going to be either the starting middle or the starting right side linebacker on our high school football team. I mean, for a freshman, that's a big deal. He was somebody, I loved him, and he was such a kind guy and then one night the summer of our uh, eighth grade going to ninth grade year he walked off the side of lookout mountain still don't know what happened dead and i missed him and i remember shedding tears jody anderson we lost him that same year in a much more tragic much more violent way that was going into our freshman year you know that was a, that was a big thing back then and i remember how much that hurt my feelings i was brought to remember those kind of quick tear passions when a few years back I was looking through I don't know if you guys uh, you older folks you have those memory pages from your high school and I'm just you know zipping down through there and lo and behold there's one of my good friends he had died of cancer and I didn't even know it uh, we grew up, he was just Calvin Webster his uncle owns the barn nursery down there his brother excuse me uh, and I remember how I mean I just immediately shed tears and when you get older, you don't, I don't know, I just don't cry as much as I once did because it burnt my eyes, something fierce. It had been so long, I guess I had so much saline build up. So I guess what I'm trying to tell you is that the older you get, sometimes you get harder. And, you know, I had to spend some time with this because uh, compassion is something that I have to work on. Uh, especially when it comes to, you know, there's children. It's usually pretty easy to be compassionate. A lot of times women, I think, that have been in situations that are bad, you know, I'm pretty compassionate, but I'm pretty rough on men. I've always thought men all act like men, but, you know, uh, nowadays, uh, you know, it's hard for me. And so that's, that's my soul to you. Uh, be compassionate now while you're younger. It's easy to become bitter with age. Something I fight, something I, I struggle against. Try to be sweeter. You know, like a... Uh, you know, they say some things get finer with age. You try to do that. Some will play on your compassion. How many times have you ever watched a UNICEF commercial and they show you a guy my age hungry? It just don't work that people use that. They know that children will, will um, it's hungry children. Man, we want to go do something about that, don't we? When you see that little child and the belly swollen, and I always thought they was real full because somebody fed them just then. But that's actually what happens when you're starving to death. Your uh, gut will bloat. We see that and immediately we're like, man, what can I do? Man, can I send some money? Brethren, friends, young people, you can feed the entire world 3,000 calories a day and feed the whole world. But if they die lost, what have you done? We've got a bulletin, a, bulletin, a, a billboard on I-24 coming from South Pittsburgh, Chattanooga. And on the, one of the sides, it says, uh, let's, end, let's help us end poverty. And I always kind of chuckle because what did Jesus say? The poor, you'll have what? Well, to all y'all get together and pay a lot more taxes. Then we'll, no, you're going to have them always. That's just the nature of it. People, there's going to be poor people. There's going to be wealthy people. Uh, with that said, you know, one of the things that we try to do with our evangelistic efforts, and I'm not, you know, 
knocking any good work that brethren are trying to do, but a lot of times we want to go build folks a building. Man, they need the gospel a lot more than they need the building. They need a solidified teaching more than they need uh, a pavilion to eat under. You know, we, one of the things, you know, Brother Woods, I just love that man. He made so much sense talking about, you know, had the big controversy about eating in the building back years ago. You young folks won't know nothing about it. Uh, I, mean, I hope, I hope we're beyond that. But there was a big controversy about that. Brother Woods would always just make it so simple. And he would just tell brethren, look, when the first Corinthians 14 was written, or excuse me, 11 was written, the church didn't own any property. They didn't own one nickel of property. Where were they meeting? They were meeting in each other's homes. And they knew each other, and they looked at each other, and they saw each other daily. Young friends, you can feed the whole world, but if folks die lost, and that's the important thing. What is the most important thing in the world? And it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the good news. Of all the things you know, the algebra you've taken, the classes you've got, where you're going to go to school, the most important thing in your life is to fear God, keep his commandments. That's what life is all about. That involves Jesus Christ. I want to teach you a word. It's one of my favorite words in the Greek because uh, <laughs> some words in some languages are, are, are made because they describe what's going on. You ever heard somebody talk about plunge? <laughs> we plunge something. It's like when you throw something in the water and it makes that sound or dip, dip. Those are words that come from things. The Greek word for compassion is splagna. Splagna. You're like, oh, that sounds like some kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, stew, doesn't it? Let's have a bowl of that splagna. And, uh, but what it is, it talks about your bowels. It's your bowels yearning. And so when we see Jesus, Matthew 9, 36, saw the multitudes, he's moved with compassion because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. It says he, he, the compassion, he could feel it in his tongue. Have you ever... At your age, it'll probably be your first boyfriend or your first girlfriend. But you remember when y'all broke up and you thought you was literally going to die? You couldn't even breathe, remember? Yeah, come on. I know you've been there. Uh, you might not want to be like, I ain't never done that. Yeah, you have. Yeah, that, that feeling of just, just toy, compassion, feelings, feelings for something. One of the things I think that's missing a lot of times in our evangelistic efforts is our real understanding of where people that are not saved are going to go. A lot of times they're in our own homes. They're in our own families. You know, uh, when Jesus says the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few, the very next chapter, chapter 10, he calls the 12 and sends them out on what we call the limited commission. And the church is where to go to all the world and preach the gospel. These men were just to go to, don't go to the Gentiles and don't go to the uh, Samaritans right now. That's for another time. Right now, we're going to go to the lost sheep of Israel. So that's what prompted that. Again, in Matthew 14, he sees the multitude. John the Baptist has just died. You know, there was a transition there anyway from John's disciples to learning to become Jesus' disciples. And so he's just died. Some people are upset and they're following Jesus on foot. They're, they need a leader. They need a shepherd. And so what does he do? Once again, he has compassion. And what does he do? He feeds them. Not only that, but Jesus had a, a work ethic. And that's when uh, he spent... Like uh, Roger sent me some notes on some of the things to talk about. You know, some of his trips, I didn't realize there were over 200 cities in Galilee. You know, you look at the map, you only see a few. Well, it's just like looking at a map uh, of uh, Tennessee. You know, you're going to see, you know, Nashville, Chattanooga, Knoxville, but you're not going to see all those little bitty places unless you have a really big map. Uh, but there were all kinds of villages around there, and Jesus went. When his disciples went out preaching, where did he go? He went preaching as well. And what did he say? I must work the works of him that sent me. There's a duty. There's a job. There's a responsibility. He says, my meat, my food. When his disciples came back and said, you want to eat from the lady at the wells? We'll see here in a moment. He said, this is my food. This is more important to me than eating. Now, how many of us can say that about much? You know, what's more important than eating? Uh, not a whole lot. You know, our bodies tell us we're real quick to, to remember when it's time to eat. And Jesus said, my meat, my food is to do the will that sent me. And so, uh, you know, to, to go requires workers. Where's he going to get those workers? It's going to come from the, the pool right here. This is it. You're the workers. In order for folks to go, they have to be sent and they have to go. Here I am, send me. Now, you might be thinking, well, you know, I'm not talking about like, like Roger there, man. Roger's a world traveler, you know. He knows more languages. Uh, I can't even count them on my toes how many he knows. Uh, I'm not very good at English. But uh, 
you can go in your own living room. Most of us can go around our own supper table. And you better believe a family reunion or a ball game or any of those other things that we spend our time doing, there's folks sitting right there that you can strike up a conversation with. And uh, I go to what time, Roger? I go when? Till I'm, oh, yeah. About 11. Oh, we've got 20 minutes, so let's go ahead and hit this passage too. I was going to uh, get rid of this if uh, we didn't have the time. I think I've got time. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke 10. Luke 10. Luke 10, there's a fella that Jesus has been teaching, and in verse 25, Luke 10 at verse 25, behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. It's one of those situations where they're just simply trying to catch Jesus in something. You know, he's caused a lot of trouble. He's caused a lot of trouble for the Pharisees. He's uh, causing things that are called, you know, he's doing things that are causing upheaval with the people. Uh, he's teaching this stuff, and it's, uh, so they're trying to catch him. And he says, Master, tempting him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus turns it right back on him, if you will. He says, you know what to do, basically. He says, what is written in the law? What do you read? How does it read to you? You've read the law. You're a lawyer. That's what you do. You know, you copy it all. You're a, a person that studies it all the time. And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thine soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And what's Jesus say? You just got a hundred on this exam. Great job. He said, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. You've got it, man. Do that. But he willing to justify himself. In other words... Well, that looked pretty stupid, didn't it? Uh, I asked Jesus a question. I'm trying to catch him in something. And he says, you already know the answer. And then made me tell him publicly. Well, I got to do something. I look, like, I look like an idiot here. So, okay, willing to justify himself or make himself look like, hey, there was really a point to what I said. So he just comes up with part B. Willing to justify himself, said, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered. And, of course, I think all of us are very familiar with what we call the good Samaritan. There's a couple of things involved with that. First of all, the Jews didn't think real highly of Samaritans. Uh, reason being, uh, there had been wars for centuries. The northern kingdom had been taken away into captivity. The Assyrians' nature, the, what they did in their uh, repopulation campaign was bring other peoples in who kind of uh, were with some of the folks that were there. And so they had a kind of a, a half-breed, as they would look at it, group of people. And so... They weren't real fond of the Samaritans. As a matter of fact, they tried to stay away from them. And they didn't consider Samaritans nor uh, goys, as they would call me and you. That's a Gentile, or uh, Gentiles as they'd call them. They didn't consider them neighbors, you know. Uh, they, they, they considered them like not really even to be dealt with. You know, we just stay away from them. Wash your hands when you've been around them. Just stay away from them. They're just a different class of people. And so notice who Jesus is going to bring into this. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. If you go anywhere from Jerusalem, guess which way you're going to be going? Down. It's up on a hill. And so that's why the Bible says that. Also, although some people will try to look at a map and say, well, look, he's going east or west. He ain't going south. He's not talking about that. He's talking about elevation. If you've ever done much hiking, that's a lot more important, isn't it? And fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed him, leaving him behind for dead. By chance, brethren, I tell you what, for all your friends and folks who think that God has a plan from everything and there's nothing that we can do to deviate from that and that everything that happens is God's will. That baby dying, God did it. That older person getting hit by that truck, God did it. Uh, that plane falling out of the sky. I wonder why God killed all them people. By chance, we live in a world where things, uh, people are making choices over here that affect people over here. Screws fall out, tires break, things happen. People are on Facebook other than driving. They slam into other cars. There's a wreck by chance. That's what the kind of world we live in. By chance, there came down a certain priest. Now, remember, a priest is, a, is a, from the Levitical tribe, and he goes and works in the temple. And he saw him, but what does he do? Well, man, I got to get to the temple, you know, because after all, I'm somebody... I'm a religious worker, and so I need to get there. Well, notice likewise, Levi, when he came by, looked on him and passed by on the other side. So remember, the priest was a Levite, but he was a, a direct kin to Aaron. So you have two religious folks there, both, you know, religious workers, if you say. If you say. 
and passed by on the other side. But notice here's a Samaritan. Now this would immediately just kind of give them a little disdain, if you will. A Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion. He had that splogna again. He felt for the man. He probably knew what it had been like to take a licking sometimes and how bad, it, what a desperate situation you'd be in. He can't help himself. He's been beaten to a point where he can't do anything about it. He needs some physical help. Well, he had, of course, he binds up his wounds and he puts him on his own animal, takes him to a nearby inn to take care of him. And as he left, he said, listen, take care of the man, gave him some money. And if there's, you need any more than that, when I come back, I'll pay you. And so Jesus said, now, which of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And what does the man have to do? It is obvious what the answer is. And so he must answer it himself, of which he does. He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Young folks, listen. That's a great thing. We need to, you know, that we even have good Samaritan laws. You know, if you pass somebody that's in distress, you know, you can be prosecuted if you don't stop and help. I mean, it's just what people ought to do when they see people in a, in a distressful situation, as long as they can do it safely. But what you and I do is we see people every day and they are just like that man. They are in a spiritual dying situation. They're lost. And unless they get some help, unless somebody, somebody that knows the truth, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, unless that person shows mercy on them, what's going to happen to them? They're going to perish. And they're going to perish on that trail that they've been walking, wherever that is. They're going to die lost. Am I trying to make you feel guilty? No more than I. No more than I. How many people have I passed by on the other side just because it's more convenient? I was doing other things. So he asked this man, he, opens, he asked him open questions, as Brother uh, Roger put in my notes. Open questions, you know, answers that he could answer. He, he can see it. You know, what do you think that implies? Which of those was his neighbor? He says, the one that showed him mercy. Go and do thou likewise. You can help pe point people in the right direction. I was one of those people on the road to there, if you will. Wounded, needed help. And I just happened to have an old sawhorse preacher that wasn't going to let me keep going uh, down that path of being lost. And when I would argue with him about the necessity of water baptism, you know what he would do? He'd take me to the Bible. He'd say, read that. And I'd start reading. He'd say, read it out loud. And I'd read it out loud. He'd say, what did it say? And i said, well, it says you ought to be baptized. And he says, well, then why are you saying you shouldn't? I said, but, he said, read this. And so I would read it. I'd put my finger on it. Baptism, it was there. Why was I fighting it? Because I had been taught to fight it. And then when I'd call the people up that had taught me to fight it, why am I fighting this? They'd try to explain it to me. And at the end of the day, it just didn't make any sense. Why am I fighting? You've got friends that are in that same situation. They've heard something their entire life. They don't know why they use mechanical instruments and music. They don't know why everybody in the audience tries to speak in tongues. They don't know why it is that they do the things they do in worship. They've just seen it since they were this high. Or maybe they've had to memorize catechism or something like that where they've got these rules memorized in their head. They're not in the Bible. They've just had to memorize that. So they're going to, you can help them with that. Be merciful, merciful unto them. The last one I'd like for us to look at, if you turn your Bibles to John chapter 4, a passage I know all of us are just over the top familiar with. It's a very wonderful passage. But one that I've probably looked at a million times. And because of the two weeks I've put into this, I've looked at uh, maybe a million and ten more. And... Uh, I see so many things that I just hadn't paid attention to. You know, a lot of people like to look at verse 2. Though he, Jesus himself baptized not, it was his disciples. So baptism was not really all that important. Same thing they'll say with Paul. And Paul says, I'm glad I didn't baptize any more of you. Because, uh, you know, the problems they were having with that. And what kind of problems were they having with that? Well, here's the deal. We had a man visit Wednesday night, <clears throat> teaching in our summer series. He also was a missionary to Guyana. And he says when he goes, one of the things, and Roger could probably touch on this and hammer it home a lot better than I could. When he goes and teaches at a place, he highly recommends. In fact, he tries not to baptize anybody. He tries to get the locals to baptize. Why? Because it's a chip on your, in your, or a feather in your cap or, or what 
that, you know, well, you know, you start getting an argument with somebody. I mean, I've had, I've seen people do this now. Well, I was baptized by a guy in woods, you know, and, uh, well, <laughs> sorry I even spoke to you, you know, like that's something. Who does the baptism? That baptizing is not important, but people look at it that way. And so, if you know, if you've been baptized by an American, that's a big deal, you know, uh, than it is if you've been baptized by a local. That's not the right way to look at it. And I believe that's really exactly what's happening here. That's not Jesus' responsibility. He's got lots of people there that can immerse people. Same thing with Paul. Uh, because what was it causing in Corinth? It was causing problems like we just spoke of. And so it's important. Well, anyway, he left Judah. He's going to go into Galilee. That's got to go north. <clears throat> And so he must needs go through Samaria. I think one of the reasons that's brought out is because a lot of times they would go on the eastern side of the Jordan and go up that way, even though you're going to meet Gentiles there. Uh, but they would go that way to stay away from the Samaritans. We'll see in just a moment why they do that. Uh, then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called uh, uh, Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied on his journey... You know, when Keith quoted Philippians 2 a while ago, Jesus thought it not something to be grasped, to be held on to, to be like God, but emptied himself, literally put on the form of a man. He became a man. And guess what men do? They get tired. Jesus was God in the flesh, but Jesus was also a man. He got tired. You get tired? I get tired. We all get tired. That's the nature of men. Jesus is tired. In fact, he's so tired, the disciples, I, I guess, Leave him there so that they can go buy food, which is all going to be pretty neat. They're going to try to go and buy food in a Samaritan area. And so they're going to try to find kosher food. <laughs> so what, they're going to buy dried goods and fruit, I guess. But for the most part, you know, they don't even like touching what Samaritans have taught. But this is a whole different mindset. Jesus is here. He's going to be talking to a woman. And that's something Jewish men just didn't do. And I'm not talking about her just being a Samaritan woman. But they didn't even talk to their own wives in public. It was considered uh, improper, if you will. And so somebody that wanted to be proper would not even speak to their own wives in public uh, in the Jewish tradition. I don't know how everybody held to that, but I know some right of that. Uh, <clears throat> here comes a woman from Samaria to draw water. She's not with anybody else. She's by herself, which is, you know, I think says some things about her situation in life that we'll learn about here in a moment. And hey, what does he do? Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. Young people, I want you to think about that for just a moment as I'm quickly running out of time. Think about what he did. <clears throat> when she walked up, and I know what y'all do, I see you do it around me, particularly. Nobody wants to talk to me. So you know what happens when I'm walking by people? They have to dig. Man, where's that cell phone? <laughs> there it is. And they'll walk by me like this, you know. You know, like, I ain't got to look at him now. And I know y'all got, got great vision, man. You'll see somebody, you know, they're there and they're brown people they don't want to talk to, so they're all. And then, oh, look, it's Becky, and Becky's 300 yards away. And they run to go see Becky because Becky's their best bud or something, you know. Put your phones down. You know, act like you got eyes and that you're a person and that you could communicate with something besides your thumbs. I talk to people and they're like, no, that ain't how it works, is it? You know, Keith was talking about what you can do. I spoke about this at Bible camp this year. Man, you're such an encouragement. If you'll get out there and smile, have some personality, talk to people, be social, you know how to do it. Just play like you're on your Xbox and you're talking to your, you can even wear your headphone thing if you want to, make you feel more comfortable. Carry your controller with you and look at people and talk to them. You'll make a huge impact on the church. The church will be more welcoming. It'll be older people will open up. But don't, you know, as Brother Cliff always likes to say, you like you've been weaned on a pickle and you suck it on a lemon. You know, just bad. Temp. You don't want to be like that. Don't be like that. He, look, he makes eye contact with her and he asks her something that all of us, you know, we can use some water, right? Give me the drink. Boom. Ice is broken. For his disciples were going away to buy uh, food. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, you can see this is not the practice. How is it that thou being a Jew... Ask us, drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria for the Jews. Now, this is the end of her statement. And then you have uh, John writing, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. You want to know what the Jewish Gentile, or the Gentile, excuse me, Jewish Samaritan relationship with? This is all the Bible that we have on it. You just don't have any dealings. You got to read other stuff to find out just how far that went 
one thing in mind here in a moment. She's going to talk about the temple on Mount Gerizim. The Jews, a hundred years before that, had burned it down. So there was some pretty bad blood. You know how we got cannons around here are everywhere because Civil War, you know, war between the states. Uh, it had been the same way there. There were monuments there. They'd been fighting, and they weren't happy with the Jews, and the Jews weren't happy with them. Just one of those situations. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God. You know, I find that interesting because what did he say in John chapter 3, verse 16? For God so loved the world that he gave what? His only begotten son. Who's the gift of God? Isaiah 9 at verse 6. The gift of God. Christ, in my opinion, is talking to himself. 50 minutes. I've got it. Uh, I think he's talking about himself. He uses con con coordinated conjunction there. And, and who it is that saith to me, give me to drink, then thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Living water. He uses water here. That flips her. She has no idea what she's talking about. She wants to go. She's talking about, man, I can have water forever. Just like Nicodemus, born again, chapter 3. What are you talking about born again? Can a man climb into his mother's womb? No. Uh, Jesus says, tear this temple down, chapter 2, and in three days I'll build it back. You see how he would take a, a, an ordinary thing, like the temple, the word temple, and make people think about that. They immediately went to the physical temple and couldn't understand what he's talking about. Nicodemus immediately goes to childbirth. Can't think about what he's talking about. She immediately goes to water, but notice the continuation. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Whence hast thou this living water? Art thou greater? This is a may sue in the Greek. It, it, what that means is 90, like 5% of the time, she's expecting a negative answer. She said, who do you think you are? Some of the newer translations will do that. Do you think you're greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus could have said, yep, but he didn't. He doesn't touch her uh, prejudices there. He goes right on. Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. And the water that I shall give him shall be a well. It's going, to, it's going to just even have more water. He's going to be bubbling over. He too is going to be helping folks get everlasting life with that water. The woman, sir, uh, woman said, sir, give me this water. And, she, and then Jesus changes it and says, go home and get your husband. And of course we find out, as Brother Keith was talking about a while ago, here's a woman that's living in a situation she ought not be in. Young people, one of the things Jesus doesn't do is he doesn't say, well, we ain't going to worry about that. You know, we got you in a building. So you're here, you're part of us. We're just going to set aside the truth and we're just going to, whatever we need to do to acquiesce to that. That is exactly what's happening in the churches today. And listen, back then, when you get down to verse 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If you throw out truth, you might as well throw it all out. That's what sets the church apart. We're trying to help people heal their lives and the only way that you can do that is with the church, with the truth. I've got an article here from the Christian Chronicle this time. It's a woman that's going around speaking. She's a member of the church. She's uh, come out and affirmed. She's written a book called Affirming. She just married her girlfriend. And she goes around to Church of Christ and holds seminars where she says she has fully moved to affirming the position of same-sex marriages. She says, 59, how that her understanding of the Bible had changed. Let me tell you something. The Bible has not changed. And it's not going to change. The Lord says, my word shall never perish. It's going to be here. And no matter how much you're pumped up in school and you're told that the LGBT, QRM, LMNOP, whatever community is, that we ought to just be accepting of that. If we don't leave out, do not forget the truth of the situation. That is sin. And how do you get, what do you do with those folks? Well, you teach them the truth. You give them the opportunity to fix that situation. You help them. You help them. My time is gone, but I wanted to share this with you. I was eight years old, and there was a long-haired hippie dude walking down the street in Highland Park where I lived. And he was going along doing this. And so, you know, I was too dumb to know any better, so I hop on my bicycle, I chase him down. I say, well, man, who are you talking to? He said, who am I talking to? I am talking to God. And I was like, well, can he hear you? And he said, sure, I've never been in church building in my life. My parents didn't go to church. He said, yeah, he can hear me. He said, you can talk to him too. And I was like, well, does he talk back? He said, he sure does. About that time, this is not a preacher's story. I remember it like it was yesterday. He stepped out into the street at an oncoming car. And that car stops. He walks to the front of that car, reaches in. I guess it's his wife or somebody. Reaches in on the dash and gets this Bible. Comes back and hands it to me. 
and said, God talks to you too. He didn't know me from Adam. I never saw him again. But I have that Bible I got in the front there, given to me by a man walking down Union Avenue, Highland Park, Tennessee, 1972 or 73. I can't remember if I was seven or if I was eight. That left an impression on me, and I, you, I marked this Bible all up. I mean, it's, I spent time with it. I, I loved it because it had pictures of Jesus in it. You ever have a Bible with pictures in it? This one had pictures in it. I have it to this day. What did that man do? He stopped and talked to a seven or eight year old boy and he gave him a Bible and it made a real impact on me. You can do the very same thing. You can do the very same thing. Thank you for your time.